This is a, a version of this um, a lecture about writing novels, which um, I've given over the years, and um, it's improved over the years. And I thought of new things as I went along. Um, not only will there be a version on mine, uh, but there's a version in this book as well with examples and things like that. So you can study it up there. This is know, triple or something. Anyway, get on with it. I just have to dive in because there's a lot to cover. Um, you're going to listen to me talking up here, and it's going to look like uh, I'm uh, spouting holy writ or mean to be spouting holy writ. I'm, it's going to sound very uh, dogmatic, okay? It's not meant to be dogmatic. You just have to sort of put quotation marks around everything that I say. Uh, I'm dogmatic simply to make it go more quickly. What you really have to keep in the back of your mind is that you should not take what I say as how to write a novel, but first of all, take, uh, take what I say as a suggestion for reading, say, your favorite novels, and reanalyzing them, and teaching yourselves, taking the ideas that I'm going to talk about, look for those structures and books that you really like, and see how they work. See those books sort of come apart in your hands, and, and learn that way, okay? So it's not that you should just take what I'm saying. Uh, uh, at face value. You, you really ought to use it as a device for uh, reading to begin with. Also, another contextual thing to say is that this is sort of like a, I'm going to talk about a kind of middle of the road classic case kind of novel. And I'm very well aware that there's a whole kind of very creative experimental fringe. Okay. Uh, my take on that is that, that, that novel writing is a kind of a continuum, all right? Uh, and that when you move out towards the fringe, authors of experimental novels have pretty systematic ways of uh, deforming or inverting the, the main structures of the, of the conventional novel, all right? So you have the great American experimentalist John Hawkes said, plot, character, setting, and theme are the enemies of the novel, okay? And recurring event and recurring image are the true essence of fictional prose. So what he's done is just flip things, right? Because uh, most of us think plot, character, setting, and theme are fairly important. So on, a, on an outward, outer wing, you have people saying things like that. Well, uh, another example is Raymond Queneau, the French uh, surrealist novelist who wrote a novel called The, uh, the Bark Tree. And instead of having a plot that moves forward by causality, by, by narrative logic, he had a plot that was connected to, by coincidence. Every event was coincidental in the whole book. Right? So you just, they flip things. They flip some technique and change it. So that's, just bear in mind that I know that's out there and I, I'm not diminishing it at all. Uh, and to say, okay, uh, Vladimir Nabokov said somewhere, I think there's an essay on how to read it, so it's how to read, how to write. It talks about two ways of reading uh, or perceiving a, a narrative text he uses big words synchronic and diachronic or, uh, diachronic is through time so that's the way most of us read a book the first time we read for the narrative we read for what happens next we read for the characters uh, there's another way of reading and that is when you've read the book two three or four or five times it, it becomes a simultaneous object much more like a painting than something that exists in time. And you start to see static structures, repetitive structures, reflective structures, balancing structures, that the whole thing is a static structure. It's like words on a page, right? But it gives the illusion of this incredible movement through time. And so that's one of the things that I'm trying to look at a novel as a, as a set of static structures okay, that I talk about, uh, actually, uh, Six or sevens, I never remember what it is. Six, I guess it's six. It used to be seven. Anyway, uh, a, set, a set of static structures, which, and again, here's an objection, right? That why not you sit until you talk about plot, you talk about image patterning as separate entities, you're you know, making a travesty of the novel. You just can't take those things out and talk about them. So, well, you can a little bit. That's all I'm saying is for the sake of argument, for the sake of learning about something, sort of tease these elements apart, even in your reading, tease them apart and see how each one kind of works separately. 
And then as I talk through this, I'll talk also about how, in the end, they converge and, and form a kind of um, organic whole, which is what we come to think of a novel as. OK. Uh, try not to trip over things here. The, and it's the, the, the first structure that I talk, I talk about is, you sure you haven't heard this before? No, I'm telling you, I haven't read it. Oh, all right. Well, it's not the same. OK. Uh, the first thing I like to talk about, and, and just you know, bear with me, this sounds almost trivial to start talking about point of view first, but it's not. Uh, so the, the first structure is point of view, and I don't mean, I'm not talking about whether you pick first, second, or third multiple, or, or whatever you do like that. This is, in the, this is in the kind of Jamesian sense. Uh, the point of view is the mental modus operandi of the book. Okay. It may be a particular character, or it may be more than one character. But somebody's seeing the action of the book for you. All right? And you have to invent that uh, uh, perceiving subject as a, as a mental construct at some, at some level, all right? It has to be consistent. It has to have a, a modus operandi, OK? Uh, the way most people, most good novelists uh, start their point of view is that they work from desire, from what the character wants, from, from how the character hooks into the world. Uh, so, you never have a character who does something for no reason at all. This is a very common student problem, is that they uh, have a character, well, I'll make that character an accountant. For no particular reason, you know. The accountant doesn't have a passionate relationship with numbers, uh, or he's not doing it because his mother made him do it. He's just, oh, I don't know, I'll give him something to do. And, uh, and then he does this and he does that, but nothing Nothing has any uh, significance. You want to invent a way that the character fits into the world. Okay. Uh, usually, you create that consciousness by putting in a little bit of background. All right. A very common student problem is uh, is the uh, excessive growth of backfill. I don't know how, how many of you tried to write novels where the backfill began to take over after the first five pages, and then all of a sudden you were on to 150 pages of background before it, you could really get the action going. Um, and then all of a sudden you don't have a novel because you haven't moved forward anywhere. Uh, a nice little rule of thumb here, and you can see it in a lot of novels, is uh, just to, you just need, you need a little story. I call it significant history. It's significant in the sense that it tells you how the character arrives on the, at the opening of the novel wanting what he or she wants. What you need to tell me. I don't care about anything else. And if you, you know, there are, of course, of course, of course, there are novels that ex do a different structure, which is they take a his history and uh, and make it a subplot or a parallel plot kind of structure. That's a different. That's a different use of background, all right, and and quite all right. But you know, so a little bit of history tell us how the character arrived at the scene of the novel, wanting what he wants and what kind of mental construct he brings because of what he wants and his background and so forth and so on and so forth. You then want to uh, pin that down. You want to give yourself a, a way of moving through the book. And one, one thing to do here is you, know, you want desire, significant history. And then there's this thing called like, call a language overlay. Overlay. Once you have this sort of idea here, who is your character, what does he or she want, what's the background, then you will say, you know, he thinks a certain way and he talks a certain way. So uh, in the first novel that I published, I had a, my character was a newspaper man, right? This is very simple. Uh, he, in the opening pages, he looks across the street and he sees a bar hiding like an overlooked misprint, okay? Uh, that's obvious, right? But so many people don't know that, that the mind of the character has to reflect who the character is from his or her background. His passionate relationship with the world defines the language that he uses, all right? And in, of course, much better novels than mine was, they do much more than that. I had, it was a very simple novel, and I just didn't do this very much, but I did a little bit. Um, similarly, you just know right away that you can't start, you know, if, you, if your person's a newspaper man or woman, you can't have them 
talking in sailing metaphors, right? Or, or they, you know, like you can really. But, you know, students do that all the time. Because they say, oh, that's a nice metaphor. And I said, well, it doesn't fit anywhere in the book, right? Or the character. So this gives you, right away, you start to get a plan, okay? A certain sort of, you start to know, oh, he's in a scene, and he starts thinking, and he's going to think a certain way. He's going to have a certain kind of metaphorical reach, okay? Another very common uh, student mistake is to invent a point of view that's too stupid to uh, do what you want with the book, all right? And this is a point that Henry James makes in, uh, I guess the introduction to, so, have you read a novel called Princess Casamissima? Yeah, right, it's the introduction to that one. He talks about how he constructs point of view, how he constructs the point of view character so that it uh, is a sensitive enough, an intelligent enough person to perceive what he wants uh, himself to explain to the reader about the world. So, you know, your common student story is about a guy who's a bartender and, uh, drinks too much, and what can he say about the world? I mean, you could construct him, okay, you, you can do something else with that. But very often, the character is too laconic, too ill-read, too insensitive to say anything interesting about the world. So you watch it, you don't trap yourselves. This is a common problem. Uh, this creates boredom for you as the writer very quickly if your character isn't smart enough to do something, uh, to see the world the way you want. So it's, well, this is all point of view. Okay, um, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. okay, then the next thing to think about is plot. Uh, plot. That's um, the thing about plot is it's, uh, you know that word drama? Drama. Uh, oops, it's not right. <laughs> Drama's right, you know, that's the, from the Greek. Uh, Theater were a term for things, or it's a ritual theater. It was ritual turned into theater, right? It's drama, things, uh, things done, okay? Uh, but it's not just things done because they have, it has to be some sort of action, something exciting about it. So it's, uh, it's, so it's always a desire and a conflict. No, sorry, resistance. That's conflict, okay? Uh, so the plot is going to be dramatic, it's going to have desire and resistance. So we see we've got a desire repeated here, right? So this desire is obviously something you have to think about what you've got your character doing here. Um, get the character walking into the novel wanting something. This something should be something that can drive the, the, the character through the novel, all right? There's a kind of interesting ways in which this developed historically. And if you look at that other book of mine, uh, this is about Cervantes and uh, the development, history of the novel. There's a, the middle third of it is about the history of novel form, right? And it talks about, I talk about how ancient storytelling developed into a longer book as soon as we developed writing, so on and so forth, and, and how the story collection and the story collection with a frame and then the story collection with a, a journey frame developed into the contemporary novel, which is somewhat allegorical, which is the journey is a desire going through the novel, meeting the resistance, right? And that's how the development of plot happens sort of historically. It's very kind of interesting. So a desire and a resistance. The desire starts here, moves your character through the novel. Uh, the one very common problem for both stories and novels, for people writing them, is that they don't realize that, in fact, this is a very simple structure and it happens the same all the way through the novel. But it's the same desire drives the character through the novel. It's the same desire that drives a character through a short story as well. It is desire meets R, and it's the same desire and the same resistance over and over and over and over again. They, since they meet each other over and over again, they have to develop. This is one of the ways of achieving depth, as opposed to the common student stories move from desire one to desire two to desire three. And I watch them all the time. I sit there and I'm like, desire one, and then page later, desire two, and then desire three. And the really hard thing for people to learn is that, in fact, it's just the same desire meeting the same resistance. 
and stepping that through a series of actions over the course of the novel now. It helps also is to make this desire, this, this desire, oops, this desire, as concrete as possible. Right? This is another common mistake. People will say uh, that, well, my character really wants to prove himself in the world. And I'm saying, eh, OK, well, can we you know, make that more specific? Can you make that more concrete? Because that doesn't give you somebody to fight against. That doesn't give you a conflict. right? But if you say, my character wants, Bill wants to marry Sue, all right? And then you can create that by generalizing in some way or other as a, as a, as a model of wanting to prove himself in the world. So he wants to marry Sue. He wants to achieve some, something that will make her pay attention to him, and so on and so forth. Love is a great one, but there's other things. But just be very concrete, OK? Because generalization can come after. Um, OK. If you're sort of, then you're sort of, you know, we're still talking about plot. I haven't finished with plot. So you begin with a desire, OK? One of the ways of constituting the novel is to think that I'm walking in with a desire. The desire can be written as a question. Okay? And so the novel, forget about what happens. You start with the question. Will the character achieve his desire or not? Okay. And that's the beginning of the novel. And then all you have to do is realize that that's A, and at the end of the novel, we get an answer. All right. So then, this helps simplify the novel, by the way. If you just have a question and an answer, and then the fact that you can say, and it can be yes or no, right? Question, yes or no. Does he get what he wants? If uh, this yes or no doesn't you know, limit you in terms of tone or complexity, because you can say yes, but, so Bill wants to marry Sue. He finally wins Sue, and he's discovered along the way that he's a homosexual, and he really is in love with Gerald. And so he's condemned to a lifeless, dull, awful marriage, probably with five kids right already. You, you understand. It can be awful. <laughs> Or equally, uh, you know, Kingsley Amos's comic novel *Lucky Jim* starts with Jim wanting to keep his job at a terrible, literate, terrible third-class university in England. He wants to keep his job. That's the opening. At the end of the novel, he loses his job, but he gets a way better job <laughs> and a girl. So you know, it's 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 not so. But yes or no, and then what you do is you start. I love that. I start doing train track diagrams. Okay. Because you got you get your beginning, you've got your end, you've got a desire, you've got a person who thinks his way through the novel. And I start doing these diagrams. You can do this at any point in uh, constructing a novel. You can do it before you write the novel, or you can do it after the fifth draft. And uh, if you've got a, a fifth draft, then you can actually kind of go through and plot. You just do this now. Cool. You just write it in, right? This is what happens here. This is what happens here. And so you've got this series of events. Uh, basically, what you have is one large action. A, you know, I want something, and B, I get it or I don't get it. And then what I call this, I call it like stepping out. Okay, you step out the main action. So you create a series of steps. And then with novels, you can actually create ever smaller series of steps along the way. Okay, and you can break them like you can have big time jumps at various places. Uh, you can fiddle with time all, all in many different ways. But you do this, you put your events, and then you and you sort of fiddle with this. And you never do this just once. Like it's not like you made a plan and you stick with it forever. Because as you're writing, things change. I mean I've had a rough idea where I was going and, and still had to, you know, write 60 or 70 pages in and then rip it up because I made it, you know, there's little decisions that you have to make along the way. Well, I, I thought this was going to be like this. It turns out that that's fucked. So I'll have to go back and, and, and re 
right? That doesn't change that, but it gives you a, it helps you. And the other thing to, to, to do is that these have to have a, they all have to have this drama. There's the conflict, the overall conflict. And then each one of these events, which may be a scene, or it could be a larger segment, like a series of scenes, or a sequence of scenes, depending on how you step this thing up. Each one of these has to have a, an element of drama as well. I mean, you can't just write a dead scene. It, everyone has to, it's, it, it's a, a reconstruction of the desire. The character walks into the scene wanting something, has a conflict, moves through the scene, and comes out the other side and goes on to the next one with the conflict. And so the book moves through like that. If you find that you don't have a conflict, then of course you have to fix one in there somehow or other. And it, you kind of go back to what the problem is. The other thing is, so you have everything in the book has this, the overall arc has desire, resistance, and climax. And each element along the way has desire, resistance, and climax. And then, you want to also test your plot over and over again, so you don't do just once, okay? You just keep thinking this through. The character wants something, he comes in as a conflict. What does he do? You know, the first resistance, what, what does he do? Then, to you, your next event, which you may have already plotted, you have to be able to sort of say, the, the word that you use in the instruction books is that there's a causal relationship that causality leads us from one event to another in a novel. And I always found that very unhelpful. Uh, and I kept trying to think, what, 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 how do you uh, describe causality in a novel? And that's why I thought through what, what really is the case is that everything has to be motivated. Okay, the motive, the character, Motive is what drags you from scene to scene, event to event, step to step. And the motive, of course, is connected with the original desire. So your character with his desire moves in. He wants to do this. Something happens. And then he wants to do the next thing. And the connective tissue is what I call ordinary human motivation. That is, when you're writing this novel, you have to be able to go through each of your events and test it on the line of, OK, this has just happened to me, the character I inhabit, his or her body. And this has just happened. This is what I want. This has just happened. What do I do next? And if you can't get from here to here on, you know, what, do I, what will that character do next, then you've made a mistake, right? You can't, you know, either you, you know, what I've done, I've had cases where I had to move a, in my first novel, I actually had to move scenes from here to here and scenes from here to here. It's actually a neat little inversion. I just had them completely in the wrong place. But although the, of the initial plan, they looked like they were in the right place. But it has to be, a, there has to be a logic. And this, right down to the point where I, you know, sometimes I sit there and just imagine, you know, shut your eyes and say, something's, where does he move next? Like, where's the next, you know, what direction? Where are you going? You know, and you have to feel your way through the novel at the level of human, ordinary human motivation in your character. And if you have invented a, a strong enough personality and a systematic enough personality, you're going to have a very hard time feeling your way through these events. Okay? And some events just won't fit, and some you'll have to add in, stuff like that. Right? It's very helpful to do this over and over again. And if you haven't written anything at all, you can just sort of, you know, you may have three or four ideas, and you just stick them on the thing, and then you start adding little steps in between to try to get from one major event to another. It's kind of fun to do. Um, okay, so then, so that's, all this I'll sort of come back to you know, in a way, but uh, that idea of ordinary human motivation, this is a, something that I never, took me a long time to understand. Novel thought. This is, with students, I have a very hard time with this because they think that when a character is thinking that it's that bad telling, you know, that you're not supposed to do it. You know, you're supposed to show, not tell. But your character's having a nervous breakdown. Well, that's telling. No, it's not, it's not telling. 
character thought is, is action, and that's incredibly useful. So we have this, we're going to move your character from scene to scene with ordinary human motivation, and that's in the character's mind. That's the character thinking, all right? When I wrote my first novel, actually it was my third novel because there were two complete flops, you know, before that. And this was a real learner, like it was a novel with training wheels, right? That I wrote. Uh, and, uh, and I got, you know, I got my second draft, and, and I was looking at it, and I said, you know, this, this doesn't look like other people's novels. <laughs> this is, a, it's, a, it's kind of thin. There's a lot of people talking. When I look at over here at Dickens, there's these long paragraphs <laughs> of something or other. I said, what the fuck is that? <laughs> and. Uh, I looked at it, and I looked at it, and finally I figured out it was those characters are thinking. And my characters weren't thinking because I was shy. And you know, what did I know about what they thought? Um, and then I was really looked at it very carefully, and I realized that they were thinking in very systematic ways. It wasn't just on the, on the page. That uh, they were thinking in, in just in three pretty distinct ways. Okay. And it just happened to coincide with my old Latin lesson. You know how Latin, there was three words for where? Everybody nod. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, unda, which means where, where have I been? Uh, ubi, which means where am I? And quo, means where am I going? And just look, you know, over and over and over again, uh, characters in a novel are asking themselves these questions. And that's most, most thought starts here. What's happened in the novel already? What's just happened or is happening to me? What the hell am I going to do next? And um, if you read in the SN book, I give you some examples of that kind of material. But once you know that it's there, I mean, really, um, I have students who I send to look at things and they can't see this at all. They, it's, it's very interesting how they were not taught to read for this kind of material or to see it as for what it is, which is thought that is in three sort of temporal dimensions and it's all about motive and analysis of the text. It's all about looking at the novel and thinking it through. And the character works his or her way through the novel from scene to scene by thinking it through. So that you find, in, very, in most conventional novels, you find that there's a scene, and then you'll find a little bit of text here at the end of the scene about this, like what's just happened, what am I going to do next? And that leads to the next scene, all right? And in the next scene, you see a little bit of stuff here that leads back to this scene, right? Over and over and over again. And it's all done in character thought. This, uh, this is the, the author, both tracking the character through the book, but also guiding the reader through the book, right? Uh, one thing that you have to always be doing in a novel, because it's a long thing, this is one of the really interesting things about a novel, it's a, I'm like a, the old ancient oral stories, right, that you could just remember because they were short. A novel you might put down, might be a thousand pages, you know, and the author has to invent ways of telling you, reminding you what's happened, and that's part of the stuff that, that that novel thought is about is always reminding us what important things have already happened and how do they help form the motivation for what's to follow over and over and over again that's happening. Uh, so look, look for this now. And so this novel thought then, this constant thinking, and of course like depending on what kind of writer you are, you, you know, if you're Minimalist, you tend not to do too much of this, although there's a lot more than you think there is. And then if you're a maximalist, if you're a, uh, wrote Henderson, The Rain King, I don't know my name, Saul Bellow, thank you. Saul Bellow just writes whole books that are almost very little of this, just his characters thinking. And he, uh, so you play it. In my first novel, a lot of this stuff was just, oh, I, guess I was so uptight. And shy, you know, I just didn't do very much. Anyway, I, did, I learned how to, but then once you learn how to do these things, then you, you they start to, you're, 
what you write starts to change because this becomes fun and expansive. So that, that this kind of stuff has taken over my writing, like my stories. My characters just blather on. You know? It's usually pretty interesting blather, but it's all, you know, they, they, they enjoy thinking what's happening about what's happening in their, their lives. Okay. Uh, okay. Right, yeah. Okay, now. So that, but you see how this character thought connects in with now plot, right? This is this is your character thinking his or her way through the plot. Also, it's telling the reader how to read the plot and guiding the reader through the plot. It's it's very useful technique. Then the other thing is you have to know that I did this little diagram, right? This is your plot, this is your A, your B. The next thing is subplot. This is a really interesting thing about, you know, when I started thinking about subplots and I thought you know, different novels and stories, and I've always wondered, you know, what's the difference between a novel and a short story, aside from the fact that the novel is a bit longer. But then, you know, you get those long stories you know, that then turn into what they call novellas, which I don't know what that is. Uh, it's like a continuum, and they just kind of get longer and longer. What's, what I've decided is the main difference between a novel and a short story is that novels almost have to have subplots where short stories don't. Okay. And the reason for that is partly because you need the reflective structure of a subplot to help you through that kind of very awful, muddy middle of the novel. It's a way of letting your reader and yourself as a writer relax from the main plot and you know, filling in something else and getting some, what's more interesting, I'll tell you about that in a minute. But, okay. Then what's interesting about subplots is there's only two kinds. Okay, so it's, everything's kind of systematic, and, and, it, and it has this is form. It's not the novel form at some level. Is, you know, it sometimes reminds me of a sonnet. Uh, you have to know the main, you know, the structure of your main plot in order to invent subplots because subplots are always related to the main plot in one of two ways. It's either congruent. And it's the same arc of action, or it's the exact opposite. Okay, that's the only two alternatives. If you go somewhere else, you're off plot, you're off topic, and you're going to be bored. That's the downside of not doing something that's focused. Um, so if you look at like my the class, the example I use over and over again is uh, Anna Karenina, right? Uh, and the main plot is about Anna who. Uh, <coughs> has an, uh, leaves her husband, has an adulterous relationship with Vronsky and ends up uh, killing herself. And uh, the main subplot is, y'all remember? Kitty. Kitty. Huh? Kitty. Kitty and Levin. Is that, thank you. Uh, you cheated, you know me. <laughs> uh, Levin and Kitty. Um, and they have a dutiful, uh, successful marriage with kids and they live on the ranch and up um, the steps and uh, have raised peasants. <laughs> uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, if I had a student once count up the pages and uh, what Tolstoy did is he raised the, the, the subplot is, is really at the level, it's, it's about, there's about five page difference in terms of how much material is in each one. So it's a parallel plot, which is a version of the subplot. So there's two plots. They're both the same. Uh, did I say the same? I meant the opposite. That's the opposite. Sorry, that was an example of the opposite. The, so we have uh, Anna and Vronsky, Levin and Kitty. They're exactly the opposite. Okay. Now we know Tolstoy knows exactly what he's doing because he has a third plot, which is uh, Stefan Oblonsky and his wife, his name is Patty. And it opens with a subplot scene. It opens with a scene uh, with uh, Stefan waking up in, the, in his study because his wife has caught him screwing the maid and uh, throwing him out of the bedroom. So he wakes up in the bedroom, in the, in the study, and his servant brings in his coffee and shaves him. And he's trying to figure out how to make, make up with his wife. Okay. Um, and, there, and that plot goes through the novel, and that is the same. It's an, an adultery plot, or the, the story of an adulterer. Okay. Uh, much less text. Okay, this is uh, 
where you get variation, right? Is it how much text you want to uh, devote to a, a plot? This is much less. This is almost equal, much less. Um, all right. And that's basically your two alternatives. If you go somewhere else, if you just, uh, there's other ways of talking about this. Uh, there's a, a novel character in Quarles and uh, Aldous Huxley's novel Point Counterpoint, who talks about novel writing, and he talks about how to, how novelists are always putting similar characters through similar events or different characters through similar events, something like that. He explains it slightly differently. But there's a, a pattern to this, okay? Subplots obviously have other characters, and they come in the novel. They weave in and weave in and weave in. Uh, they can have more or less uh, material related to them. Uh, the other key thing to notice about these is that there's often a very close kind of relationship between the characters and the plot and subplot. Right? There's a, another concept called, uh, that I'm not really going to talk about, called character grouping and gradation. And that is that in most of these novels, the characters are grouped. They're all, they're, they're somewhat similar. They're variations of each other. They're, they're graded variations, all right? It turns out, and, and, and they're grouped in, in often a sort of family or some kind of group uh, relationship. In this case, what's interesting, Tolstoy says in his letters that he always goes to family members to create subplots. So uh, we have Anna, the adulterer, and Stepan, the adulterer, the brother and sister. Okay. And uh, Patty, the wife here, uh, is uh, Kitty's sister. Uh, one effect of that is that these people then obviously know each other, right? So that there's a lot of, this is what you start to get with these structures, is a commenting back and forth. You get the kind of echo chamber effect. This is where it kind of, the, the sense of life of a novel, because you, a novel is going to be about a, a limited set of characters. But you create a sense of a teeming world by having these related events happening to different characters who know each other and look at each other and talk about each other, all right, and echo the thoughts and structures that you want, you know, are implicit in the novel itself. In this case, they do know each other, they exchange letters, they see each other at parties. At a certain point, Oblonsky's wife, Patty, comes and lives on the ranch with Levin and Kitty brings the kids, runs away, and then there's a you know, big fuss about that. Uh, there are uh, uh, other sorts of relationships, you know, like Mary McCarthy wrote a novel called The Group, which is about a bunch of classmates, right? Plots, subplots. Uh, you can have uh, upstairs, downstairs structures, a very famous one, like, you know, we have a Shakespeare, we have a lot of uh, British novels of a certain era. Uh, Don Quixote is basically an upstairs, downstairs novel because we have the Quixote plot and then actually uh, Cervantes basically invents the subplot in the second half of Don Quixote because he has, uh, he's got Quixote moving along through the book and finally he, he you know, rockets. Sancho free, I and mean, Sancho has a plot of his own, which is in fact much the same as Quixote's plot, except that uh, Sancho, he's, Quixote never gives up his fantasy until the last pages when he dies. Sancho Panza, whose fantasy has been to be a governor, he's, he's given the governorship of an island. It's a fake, it's a false thing. But the poor guy, he goes in there and he, and he thinks he's a governor and they screw him around and he has to make decisions. And he does pretty well. And he surprises them. But then he goes down to the stable and talks to his donkey, Dapple. And they decide that he, well, Dapple doesn't talk to him. Uh, he decides that really this isn't what he wants. He doesn't want his dream. He wants to go home. And, uh, and this is a beautiful thing. But Quixote never grows up, but Sancho Panza becomes a human being in that course of that novel. And the, the two things, you know, 
somewhat unconsciously for the reader, reflect each other. Mm -hmm. they're, they're opposite, they're, they're given the same issues, and they react in different ways. And I mean, to me, that's one of the great things about that novel, is the moment when Sancho becomes a human being, you know, and says, no, I'm not, this novel is fucked. I'm not <laughs> going through with this anymore, you know? He also has a marriage, whereas Don Quixote only has a fantasy girl, right? And also, uh, and you see this, I mean, this is character gradation. They're graded versions of each other. Quixote has the fantasy. Sancho has the fantasy, but he manages to get over it. Uh, Quixote uh, goes crazy because of books and writes all the time. Or doesn't write, but he, he, can, he can write. Uh, Sancho is illiterate. But one of the jokes in the novel is that Sancho and his wife, uh, who is also illiterate, ex exchange more letters than Quixote manages. Quixote tries to send letters to Dulcinea, but they, of course, can't get anywhere. But Sancho can write letters to his wife and get letters back. It's full of little jokes that kind of going off topic. Sorry. All right. There's a beautiful little essay. This character grouping and gradation, the best little description I've ever seen of it, is in a kind of miraculous little book called Rhythm in the Novel by a uh, Canadian dead academic. He wrote the book before he died. It's um, a joke. Uh, um, called E.K. Brown. It's out of print, so you have to you know, find it on the internet. But uh, he talks about character grouping and gradation. And it's best. Nobody else talks about things like this. Um, and now it's plot and subplot, but one of the best little pieces I ever read about that is a tiny little three-page essay uh, written by William Butler, Butler Yeats called The Emotion of Multitudes. And you have to find it in a collected work somewhere. And he just talks about subplots in, King, in uh, Shakespeare, but mostly in King Lear. And, the, and that's an upstairs, downstairs play, right? With like Lear and then Gloucester. And the fool, but and Lear and Gloucester both have trouble with their kids in this thing. And, and he just says that what you get is you get this echoing, resonating effect, and it creates what he calls the emotion of multitudes, which is just a gorgeous phrase, it seems to me. But now, and you begin to see sort of, okay, but we have the A and the B, we have this arc of action, this arc of action, is now reflected in other actions. Okay, here's another good example. How are you? Okay. Oh, uh, do you all know Ann Tyler's novels? Yeah. Uh, what's the one called? Oh, Accidental Tours. You know. Uh, she's got Macon, right? Can you say Macon or Mason? Yeah. Macon. Uh, and he's a sort of uptight very systematic kind of guy who overthinks all of the systems in his life and uses it to protect himself, right? And uh, his main plot is he meets the, meets the dog trainer and she tears him out of his life and makes him fall in love. That's the main plot, right? What's the subplot? What's the first subplot? Do you know, do you know? It's, it's Rose, it's his sister. And what is Rose? She, Rose is the person who alphabetizes the soup cans in the family house, right? And, and keeps everything very neat and very organized. And, uh, and oddly enough, and she takes care of the brothers. Right? But oddly enough, she falls in love. Macon, no, oh, okay, Macon's the top guy. Falls in love with, and eventually ends up with a, a dog trainer. Uh, he goes and lives with her, actually, for a while. Then they break up, and they get back together. Rose uh, falls in love with Macon's publisher, and moves, I think she moves out with him, then she moves back to the house and breaks up with him, and then at the end of the novel, he moves into the house with her. See, so we have, it's the same plot, there's some sort of variation. Okay. And she's a graded version of Macon. Macon actually gets out of the house and embraces chaos. And when she can't quite, but it's still pretty good. Then there's two brothers. They're the same guys. And, and basically, we talk about the, the two brothers uh, have unsuccessful marriages and family lives and never you know, get back on track. So what you have is a, you can count the brothers as one plot, but actually the truth. So it's, uh, it's like one, two, three, it's a four plot novel. Right? She's brilliant at this. She's 
she's you know, a very un, very popular writer, but I think un, un, uh, not, not as well judged as she should be. But you can also look, I mean, the same thing. Oh, my God, this is endless. Uh, and, uh, Jane Austen's Mansfield Park, you know, all read that last week. Uh, it's the Bertram family. Bertram family, there's two daughters and two sons, right? And they're all uh, you know, privileged fuck-ups. And uh, the older brother is uh, a gambler and, and uh, does bad things and almost dies. But then he straightens out. The uh, younger brother looks is the one who wants to be a minister, right? And, uh, and he gets carried away from that main girl, the heroine he should be with, by a, you know, an airhead sort of person. And he almost screws up and then finally comes back and marries the right person. And then there's the two sisters. The one uh, runs away with a really, with a rich, stupid guy on his board. It's okay. The other one runs away with the airhead's brother, who, who never marries her and just, you know, will, you know, say in Jane Austen that they had sex, but she's ruined forever and has to go and live in France where all the ruined people go. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, and they're just, they're all variations of the same characters, you know, it's very interesting. They're all, and they're all, and I'll go on about that. Okay, theme. Theme, I just want to talk about theme briefly. So if you have these subplots, and subplots are the same pattern. You see how the thing starts to be a kind of organic unity. It's all, it has a kind of cohesion. And this desire leading to the answer drives that arc, which drives these arcs, and so on and so forth. So there's a system in the novel. Theme, okay, theme is, we really have a hard time figuring out what theme is. But I ended up giving it a real, a kind of a Rube Goldberg definition. I call it a usable general statement of the author's belief about human nature and the way it interacts with the world. Okay. The character wants, Bill wants to marry Sue at the beginning of the novel because she's cute and he's shy and she says hi to him one day. That doesn't look like yes, an, you know, an epic story of, of love and passion, does it? Well, you have to do something with the plot, but you also have you know, what does that mean to you? You know, I mean, let's come back at this and put this other way. Lots of people kind of buy their themes off the rack, okay? They, they, uh, there even are writers who look at newspapers, you know, like some big story comes up and they'll write a novel based on that story, uh, the idea of the story. Remember that Chambers guy who murdered the girl in Central Park? Yeah. And there was a guy who wrote a novel based on something like that, I forget what it was called. But he actually made quite a good living writing novels based on things. Uh, or you can write a, a detective novel or a romance novel, you're, you're buying your theme off the rack. Uh, a lot of people uh, say, well, I'm gonna write a novel about power relations between men and women. Or I'm gonna write a novel about uh, a woman, you know, finding some sort of emancipation or something like that. And I'm, and I'm just sort of saying, yeah, you know what? This is just like, you're doing something that the culture is telling you to do, or uh, you're, uh, you're doing what your mother would like you to do. What do you really think? You know, what, what is the material? I say, I, I like people to sort of look at the material that lurches out at you. Like, what is it that you wanted to write about? Not power relations between men and women, but the characters and the action. What, what action is on the page when you first start to write? What are you thinking of? What is your character doing? And then I think, Coming to a theme is, is a kind of personal interrogation. The best themes and the best books come out of something that you deeply feel and that the action somehow incarnates. It's, it's better to have the action first and a process of discovery coming after that so that, so that you don't judge yourself to begin with. You know, just, have some idea of what you're going to write about and then start saying, well, what the fuck am I thinking about here? What does this really mean to me? It could surprise you. Actually, it should surprise you. And, and you can write very good books uh, on very naughty themes, like Henri de Montfort 
hated Jews and women. And uh, was a very popular French writer, but that's in France where the ruined people go. Uh, other people, you know, you, you don't have to be right. You don't have to tell what your mother says. You don't have to have your friends approve of this. It's just something that you really kind of deeply feel about the way the world works. And, and sort of generalize it. Like, I mean, there's a way in which I think about this. You know that there, there's that kind of epic idea that Freud invented that, that, that all we are is a battlefield for the pleasure principle and the reality principle, right? And, and all that is, is desire and resistance, right? It's desire and the world resists. Like I, I grow up and basically all, all I want is to go back in the womb. I wrote one novel about that. Uh, and, and then the, after that, all I want is a boob. Um, and you know, women, the same. Women babies want boobs too, so it's uh, sexist. But uh, you, you desire, you start with desire, you start with needs, is all I'm saying, really. Okay, that's the pleasure principle. And then the reality principle is the world resists in some way. So virtually any desire and resistance, concrete desire and resistance that you invent, Bill wants to marry Sue, can be generalized on sort of the epic scale, can be thrown up on the great screen as an example, as an allegory of every person's struggle to get the warmth, the comfort, the love, whatever, recognition the sense of uniqueness, all those things that we want, okay? So the, the concreteness can be expanded to the epic by generalization through theme, okay? So once again, it's not like you just pick this. If you, if you figure out your theme in one night, you're probably wrong, okay? You have to really question yourself over and over and over again. Think it through, write it out. I write out versions of it. Then once you've got a theme, you have to stick in the novel at least three times, okay? That's the rule of thumb, but ask more. And uh, you use character thought as a way of getting it. Now, character, the character will be sitting there saying, what the fuck is going on in this book? They may actually literally say that, or they say things like, I always like to put a character and say, I feel like I'm being written by a guy laying in bed in Gansborg, New York. What the fuck is he thinking? And, uh, and the character sort of saying, you know, what's happening to me? Why am I doing what I'm doing? What, what general principle, what, where does that, what is life about, okay? And you, you have to engage with that in the text of the novel to give the novel the kind of resonance and depth that you might want it to have, okay? And as I say, three times. What I mean by that is that you repeat it in some way. And, and this structure gives you a lovely way of repeating things, all right? Because you can have character thought on the main line about the theme, but you can also have character from here looking at a character here and thinking about the theme, or vice versa, right? Like uh, Levin looking at Anna and thinking something, and Anna looking at Levin and thinking something, and they're going to think about the theme of the novel, marriage and adultery. Well, that's not the theme the way I talk about it. But Okay, I'm sorry, this is taking a long time. Is this okay? Just a little bit more. The last, so this is five or six, I'm sure. Chalk on myself. Uh, that theme, by the way, human nature and the world, you sort of think of that as a general desire that all people have. You know, it's amazing how many people think about books and they just don't think about, because it's not fashionable now, by the way, of course. Human nature is, is a, it's a philosophical, philosophically suspect concept. You're just smiling at me. <laughs> you know what it is. And uh, you're not supposed to talk about human nature anymore. It's a fascist term. Uh, some sort. But I don't care about that. The novel is an old thing. Uh, what, what is human nature? And you don't have to be right. You don't have to read sociology books to get it right. That's not. It's what do you think? You know, in your heart. What do people want? And what does that relate, relate to the main desire of the novel? That's how you got to put that in. All right, then image pattern. Last, this is the last technique. Then image patterning is. You know, an image is just something available to sensory apprehension that you put in the text and in terms of words, right? Uh, 
You can also have other kinds of patterns that are the same structure. Uh, you look at, uh, I, used to try, I was trying to figure out what Milan Kundera was doing. And I realized that he doesn't do image patterning, he does idea patterning. So that he, he, he runs systems of ideas through his books, much the way other people will write an image pattern through the books. Very interesting. Or then I look, you know, there's the East German writer, Krista Wolf, who wrote a novel called The Quest for Krista T, in which she runs word patterns through the book, all right? Much the same way. It's repetition and, well, we'll get to that in a minute. But just realize that mainly it's an image. So, you know, um, Margaret Atwood writes a novel called Cat's Eye, and the main image of the novel is a cat's eye marble. Okay, that runs through. Um, so you have an image, right? And the first thing you do is repeat it. It's very simple. The structure of an image pattern is very simple. It starts by repetition. And you don't have to actually do more than that. Some people just get by with repetition. My first published novel, since I was very shy and restrained, as I keep saying, I managed to repeat the main image three times in 200 pages. And I thought, you know, everybody's going to see this and it's going to look awfully silly because, you know, it's dangerous territory. Nobody knows, but it's okay. I mean, I know it's there. What these things do often is the, the, your reader reads in a different way, okay? The reader reads that in that diachronic way. It reads from beginning, beginning to end. And, and, and tends not, except in very obvious cases, notice that this stuff is happening. That's okay. I mean, it helps. It gives the book a rhythm. It gives it all kinds of things. One thing it does is it help organize, helps organize you as the, the writer. It tells you. It gives you ideas of what to put in the text that, that fit. You know, how, what am I going to invent that's going to fit? Well, a lot of these concepts that I'm talking about are, are guides to the sorts of material you put in. Form helps create content in, in this way. So if you have an image and you set it up and it repeats, you know the form means, the form tells you that that image is going to repeat. So every once in a while you've got to bring it back in, somehow or other, right? So that starts, and that, you can just stop there. But then you can raise that up to something called, you know, that old word symbol, right? I'm more it, but you can load it. I, I like, my own terms. You load the repeated image with some sort of meaning. Okay, you load and control it. There's just basic devices for doing this. The so one is to give it a significant history. That is, you you put in the text a story about the image, about the image there, that is significant because it attaches the image to the main character in a significant way that generally has to do with the desire of the book in some way or other. So in the cat's eye, the cat's eye marble that's the central image of the book is a marble that's given to, her name's Elaine Risley, by her young brother. Uh, she keeps it in a jar of marbles, so she calls it a jar of light. He becomes a physicist and studies light, and then he's killed tragically. She loses the marble. The whole second half of the novel is her not searching for it, because she doesn't quite know she's searching for it. But at the end of the novel, she finds the marble. Uh, so there's a story. Okay, yeah. And then significant history, that's one way. You don't have to do all of these. You can not, you know, you mix and match. The other is just the. Position, juxtaposition and association, or semantic linking. That is, you just have the image and you put other words next to it to add meaning to it, or you associate it with other words in some, usually in a sense. Or, um, yeah, so I mean, there's a thing I've been thinking about most lately is uh, there's a little story called Shiloh by Bobby Ann Mason. Uh, do, do any of you know that story? Okay. Um, I mean, it's about a, a guy, a truck driver who's been injured in an accident, so he's home and he doesn't have a job anymore. And 
cadence, but he wants to try to get back closer with his wife many years. And so he says, well, fine, I'm going, to build you, I'm going to build you a log cabin. She says, I don't want you to build me a log cabin. And that happened over and over and over again in the story. So we have the log cabin, all right? And about the second paragraph of the story, first of all, he builds a little cabin out of popsicle sticks. Then he gets the idea to build a little log cabin. And the popsicle stick cabin, he says, looks like, it's on the television set, looks like a rustic nativity scene. That's what he says. That's loading, OK? Rustic nativity scene. Then in the next paragraph, we find out that they had a child who died, so they had no children. So we have a rustic nativity scene. In the background story, there's a child that's disappeared, there's dead. Then in that same paragraph, we have the rustic nativity scene and then the word home. He's always wanted to build her a home. Okay, so and that's repeated at least three times in the next ten lines. So we have rustic nativity scene, home, home, home. These are words that are associated with his desire to build her a log cabin. She doesn't want a log cabin. Okay, don't forget that. The story moves along. He builds more silly log cabins, like Lincoln Log, and he gets orders some plans, and he keeps talking about it, and she keeps saying, I'm going to build a log cabin. Um, and there's material in there about the crafts and the idea of he was just doing these craft things, just passing time, where it's passing time, load the image, right? And then finally, they kind of do a kind of repeat honeymoon. They go together to the Shiloh battlefield, because and there's a cabin there. So the last three paragraphs of the story, they actually come to a cabin that's shot full of holes, because it was the battle. And it's at that point, he says, well, that's not the kind of cabin I was going to build for you. And she said, well, I knew that. And then she's, by the way, and I'm breaking up with him. And that's how that works. Okay. So we have a, um, an image that's loaded with bits of imagery that, you know, he, she doesn't want it, but at the same time, it means a rustic nativity scene. It's got something to do with the idea of home that he doesn't have because his child is dead. It's also equated with just passing time, wasting time, not doing anything serious. And she knows that. So at the end of the story, she breaks up with him. The end of Cat's Eye, when she was, before she was nine, Delaney was so had a brother and a cat's eye marble and a jar of marbles. And actually, at a certain point, she takes that marble and she has a little heart-shaped purse that little girls have, something like that. She puts the marble in a heart-shaped purse. And then at the age of nine, she has a little nervous breakdown. All that stuff is obliterated. She loses it all and just it all disappears. And she grows up, she becomes a famous painter and so on and so forth. At the end of the novel, she finds uh, the heart, the marble inside the heart-shaped her purse in a trunk full of family memorabilia in an upstairs attic in her parents' house. So she finds the marble, which is whatever it is, in her heart, inside the memory. Get it? So that the, this is a beautiful yeah. construction because the story of the book is encapsulated in the, in the image at the end of the book. We have a similar thing, you know, uh, well, you've all seen that movie, Brokeback Mountain, right? Mm -hmm. well, the movie, you know, skips over the, the best part of the story, which is that Brokeback Mountain, of course, is an image, like, is, is, is like the cat's eyes, the lost image is the image that runs that story. Uh, we have the mountain, that's where they first make love. That's the same thing in history. That's where they fall in love. And then they say things like, well, we only got broke back mountain. And, and they visit other mountains, but that's never quite as good. And they never get together. Finally, Jack dies. And uh, Ennis goes back to Jack's parents' place, and he's up in the bedroom. Do you know this, y'all? Yes. Yeah. He finds the two shirts put together, right? And it's such a touching. Thing. But then he takes it home and he takes the shirts and he puts a postcard of Broke Back Mountain and he puts the shirts under the mountain. So that exactly the same thing, you have a, this incredibly poeticized and concentrated imagery that carries, you know, that's, I don't know what it is, it, it, it carries the, the, the meaning of the story in, 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 many, in, a, in an imagistic way, right? It's beautiful. That doesn't, you don't have to do that every time. And often, uh, it, to me, this kind of happens 
by chance and by luck. If you start running images through and you play with them and load them very often, they will have this way of turning up at the end of your piece of writing. I have a Okay, the same weekend history is going to tie the image in with your main character, the main character desire. Main character desire runs the plot system, right? Runs the modus operandi at the bottom. And the theme, the thematic material, explains that in a kind of generalized way. And the image pattern illustrates it as a symbol. In this way, the whole novel works as an organic device focusing on itself in some way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. In a sort of an odd way, right? Uh, just shameless self-promotion. Okay, I'm just going to, because I'll, I'll talk about my, one of my novels. Is the, the, uh, I wrote a novel about the American Revolution in a state of New York with Indians. And it's called The Light and Times of Captain Ann. Okay. It's a three plot novel. Okay. And each character has a point of view, so you move from one point of view to the other point of view to the other point of view. Uh, all three characters are displaced in one way or another by the revolution. They all, and this is said explicit, want to go home. That's the concrete desire, basically. That's all you need. It's a little concrete desire. They can't go home because they're various stupid wars and things going on. And in fact, the one character, both the father and the son, for different trajectories, actually meet at the family house in the middle of the war, and the son burns the house down, because he's pissed about something. Yeah. That ends that. But uh, they want to go home. OK, what's the theme there? The, the theme has to do with uh, difference in identity. It's that. What happens in the world, in the world, the war is just a, an allegory for the, for the world in general. The world throws the baby out into a uh, state of nature, a state of conflict, a state of alienation, a state of not getting what you want. Uh, even falling in love does that. I mean, as soon as you, the self and another, these, these situations in the world take you out of your comfort zone, they take you where there are no rules, they take you where you have no identity. People have two ways of responding to that. One, it seems to me, but, and one is to want to be safe, and to, to reconstitute your identity, to come back home. OK, so home is the defensive strategy. Coupled with that is the offensive strategy, which is embrace the other in some level. So the characters are doing kind of both as they go back and forth. They, they want to pull back from that, this and, and, and take uh, find safety and identity at the same time they also want to go out and discover something new. So the, the father wants to go home and uh, he ends up in Canada building a fake home, or building a house like the one he used to live in. But then he dies and, and there's this kind of moment when he really embraces the other because he imagines he's being tortured to death by an Indian that kind of likes it. Uh, the son who always wanted to be a revolutionary American but ended up being uh, a bad, you know, Canadian, ends up in Canada and he's a perpetual outsider. He never goes home. And the girl is kind of interesting because she uh, falls in love with an Indian boy who tries to kill her first and uh, has a baby by him. And in fact, is the kind of person who can make a home wherever she goes. She has a kind of courage and flexibility that allows her to, to not have to go back to the original home, but to kind of carry it with her in some way. So that we have the same desire, the same theme, different trajectories, all reflect versions of each other. Okay. The main image is a world, what's called the whirlwind mask. It's a it's an Iroquois mask that's half black, half red. Okay. And uh, this is that sense of these people find themselves crossing over or in the middle. They lose their identity between the self and other in the action of war. This is an image of where they all find themselves. So that opens up with the, the, the father has a headache. He has migraines and he bleeds himself by cutting 
down his forehead that the blood comes down his face like that. The, he, his horse shies and sees this image painted on a rock leading to an Indian village. Every character in the book gets this face at some point. It's just a shadow sometimes. Uh, there's a drover going by with a bunch of, I don't know, what was the wagon. He's got a strawberry birthmark over half his face. Uh, and then, okay, then I forgot. I didn't finish this up, by the way. Oh, shit, I'm sorry. There's more that you do besides loading it, and repeating it, loading. Then there's uh, splintering. That is, you split off other patterns, okay? Uh, so what happens here is I've got my mask. So I've got a mask pattern going through. It's a whirlwind mask, so I've got whirl, whirlwind. Okay, the uh, Iroquois word for mask is uh, face. So I've got faces going through. The Iroquois word for death is without a face. So we have masks, face, without a face, so on. Whirl, whirlwind. All these words start to to run their way through the book. So, okay. So that's splintering. The Victor Shkovsky, the Russian formalist, calls it the Russian language splintering. That's what he calls it. And then this is something that Margaret Atwood is good. You can do in the end. You can do these things called tying lines, where once you've got a bunch of splintered patterns going through, you can actually bring them back together again in, in, in lines of text to fit in the scene, right? And it's kind of a game. Sort of like a Sistina, except that you kind of try to do it trickily, you know? but it, yeah. hidden in a way, and because they have to fit in the scene, it has to look realistic at some level, implausible, but the words come back in, um, and then you can make it a game because you can uh, see how many you can get in. I can get four separate patterns back in, and Atwood can do four. I think I've seen her do a five. So you start anyway. That's, we start looking. This is like bird watching. We start reading for this stuff. Right? Okay, so I've got this. This is the mask, and this represents the theme. It spreads through the book all these ways. And so the whole thing is the organ again. Okay, I'm going to shut up now. Now, the, okay, now I want to give you a little bibliography to help you. Okay, so sort of the, the kind of written version of this lecture is in here. Attack the copy of this by there's an earlier essay of mine in my early book, uh, Notes Home from a Prodigal Son. It's called The Novel as a Poem, which is where I really started to think about novel form and patterning. Okay? And then there's, as I say, there's the book on Don Quixote. There's a whole uh, middle section that's called uh, Don Quixote and Novel Form. You don't have to have read Don Quixote uh, to uh, read that. I have the magazine Numero Sank, and there's a, right now I put it up on the slider for you guys, the, the thing at the top, uh, an essay by a, a former student named Vanessa Blakesley called Shades and Mirrors, Character Gradation in the Novel. It's a pretty good uh, kind of analysis of a book using that idea. Uh, and then there's the other book uh, that I mentioned, E.K. Brown's Rhythm in the Novel, which if you can get a copy of it, it's, it's really a wonderful Introduction to a kind of uh, structural way of looking at novels. It talks about character gradation. It also talks about how it expanding symbols, which is basically this structure here. Okay, I'll stop now. Some questions? Any? Um, What do you mean? Timeline. So in a novel, you have stories going on with the same character, but one is going on in the past and one in the present, like in a retrospective narrative. You have a main plot, or like kind of a backstory going on at the same time as a present-day story. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a uh, that is probably um, an. Ex uh, How to say, well, to the song. I've never read Prince of Tides. I saw the movie, right? It's Barbara Streisand. Yeah. <laughs> so I know the whole book, right? Don't I? <laughs> um, you talk about timeline. 
it, in general, what happens if you if you have a book with a large chunk of backfill like that, that's a little story unto itself, right? That it's generally structured as a plot and subplot, that they reflect each other and are connected with, in with each other in certain clear ways. In that case, there's obviously a causal connection, but the crisis, one crisis and the other crisis are, are somehow other parallel. I mean, I don't know that book, so I, it's hard to tell. But those, for student story, for, for, for early novel writers, it's actually really, really hard, by the way, to, to try to do a dual time book. It's uh, because the danger is, the, the danger is getting lost in the back film and not making it actually uh, cohere in a successful way with the, uh, with the main plot. I'm always telling people to reduce the backfill to, uh, to as, as small a section of text as possible. I mean, in that first novel of mine, man, I got the better. It, I got it down to like a page and a half in the second chapter, and that's all I needed. Then you, you kind of keep re referencing it. You remind the reader about this background, but you don't have to say more about it because the background only has to get your character in. But so, you know, I don't, do you think in Prince of Tides or something like that? Oh, um, yeah. Or, yeah. or usually in any novel that ends up with more than one plot, whether it's in the background or not, they have some parallel structure. Okay. You know, it deals with that pretty well. It's my own Dodge. It's sort of a Canadian. But in the, I mean, this whole question of time in the novel is like, it's like the hard question. There's all kinds of ways of, of cueing the reader. If you, if you look at time, just go. I always do this line, this thing. No, you don't need that. This is your main arc of action. This is the chronology. I always think, when I did those historical novels, I always go back to the first point that I can get my characters back in time. So, Life and Times of Captain Anne starts in uh, 1780. I could be wrong, I can't remember. It goes to about 1786. Maybe it's three, five. Anyway, I can't remember. But in fact, there's, and, and there's a story that goes straight like that. There is material mention that goes back into the 1600s. Okay, that's brought in as backfill in a couple of places along the way. This. It's very helpful to sort of draw out the whole chronology straight for uh, when you're thinking about anything like this. Thinking about what backfill you want to mention and then thinking about where, because where you position it kind of rolls back over the rest of the novel. But if you want to do something like Prince of Tides where you have a chunk of backfill that you're going to take and make into another plot, see, and, and then you're going to, you have to figure out how you're going to tell it in his case. Therapy sessions as 